Hello. Good morning. All right. How are folks doing today? You guys hear me, see me okay? Morning, Emily. Morning, Mikey. Excellent. All right. So, wonderful. All right, today we're going to be going on to our chi-square analysis. The slideshow is already up in Schoology for any of you that want to open it or go along. But what this really is, is this is going to be a way for us to take numbers and do a statistical analysis in order to figure out, are they valid? And for Hardy-Weinberg, and this is usually where we see it used, this is used to prove that evolution is happening because if we know what the values should be and then we actually count our values and we get something different put them through the statistical analysis and now we should be able to say either yes everything is statistically within the acceptable margin of error or we can say that no there's something else going on here and classically for Hardy Weinberg, that meant natural selection. So, on an offhand, while we wait to see if anybody else shows up, you guys should be overjoyed that we're not actually in the classroom today because this morning my, uh, my dog went outside to use the bathroom and proceeded to meet a skunk whom my dog thought was a fluffy black kitty cat and went to say hello the skunk was not impressed, yeah, and she got blasted right in the face, down her neck, um, the entire house reeks right now of skunk, which means that it's probably in all of our clothes, which means I probably reek of skunk, so you're actually all being saved from that by our uh, distancy learning coronavirus stuff. Yeah, it sucks. Um, yeah, that's just, oh, it's like rancid onion. Mmm. All right, so, with that said, let's get started on to the chi-square stuff, just so we can go through. Yesterday, I asked you guys to work on some assignments, check your math on the answer sheet, and then from there, hopefully, we could move into the second half of question 10, which is our statistical analysis for it. So, you guys are going to see, got the chi-square stuff right up in here. Uh, you can follow along if you want to or not. It's really kind of up to you. So chi-square test is basically going to test what we call the null hypothesis. Now that's a very important term for you guys. It's right here at the bottom of the first slide and the null hypothesis states that we're looking for that difference between the observed and the expected. And we want to know, is there a statistical difference or is it within the realm of chance? For instance, when we flip a coin 100 times, we expect to get 50 heads and 50 tails. Now, if you get 52 heads and 48 tails, that's not really an important difference. Statistically, that's the same thing as 50-50. But, if you get 57 heads and 43 tails, well now the question is, is this still flipping as expected or is something else at play? So you're going to see the null hypothesis uh, pointed out a number of times and it's always going to be based around this idea of is there a statistical difference in our numbers? It is usually used in order to prove that something else is happening. And more than likely, if it is, the next part of this will then be asking you, try to explain to us, what might be this other piece that we're not getting to, or that we're not seeing? Now, in order to do it, here is the equation. The x squared is just a symbol that means our chi-square. That's all it means. So do not look at that. I know people look at it and think, I'm a solve for x. You, you're, you're not. You're solving for x squared. That's just the, the symbol for chi squared. So you want to leave that one completely alone. The important part of it is on the other side of the equal sign. So our chi squared test mathematically is going to be the sum, 
that weird little epsilon e of our observed, which is O, minus our expected, square that value, then divide it by the expected. Now, that may sound pretty straightforward, and if you take a look actually at your reference tables, you can see I just brought it up. Here is the chi-square test. It's written out in the whole formula. Over on the right-hand side of that, it goes over and it defines exactly what O and E and stuff are. So all of that exists there. Freely usable on every test. So don't worry too much about memorizing the equation. Just know which one you're going to be looking for. Now the most important part of this is going to be to determine our degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom are going to be defined as our number of possible outcomes, our samples, minus one. And if that's confusing, it can be, but usually it's pretty small. So for instance, if we were doing a Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium test through chi-square, you have three different possibilities. You have your homozygous dominant, our p squared. You have your heterozygous, 2pq, and our homozygous recessive, q squared. So we have three possibilities, right? So our degree of freedom would be 2, because it's going to be the p number of possibilities, 3, minus 1. So we'd have 2 left. Now in order to figure out exactly what that value is, then we're going to have to go to a chart. I've eliminated all of the other possibilities on the chart that you're seeing up there because the only one that we ever use is the 95% certainty column, which means that we have a 5% margin of error. That is what the 0, 5 at the top of this one means, that we are at a 5% margin of error. If you look at your reference tables, you'll notice for the chi-square table, they only include two different possibilities. You're either at your 5% margin of error or your 1% margin of error. Almost everything uses the 5%. So your 0 0.05 column would be the important thing. Looking at that one. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take that critical value and then we're going to compare it to the chi-square total, to the sum. So... For instance, our critical value for what we just talked about would be right here. I don't know if you guys can see that up here. But because we had three possibilities, minus one, we're down to two. The two possibility part is right there at 0.599. So if our sum exceeds 5.99, we disprove the null hypothesis. We say there is a statistical difference. There is a problem. There is something else happening here. If your value is less than 5.99 or equal to it, then we accept the null hypothesis and we say, okay, just random chance, everything's okay. Everything's good. All right, so that's, that's a bit of stuff. Are people okay with it so far for us to move on? And as you guys are typing, did you hear that all of those morons that were going down to spring break and stuff like that, now all of a sudden we're getting hundreds and hundreds of 20-somethings that are getting sick because they decided to say, mm, to the dangers, and now they're getting it. Yes, yes, Matt, we are going to do an example. All right, well, tell you what, why don't we look back to last night's uh, work. Yesterday, I asked you guys to take a look at number, uh, what is it? No, this isn't it. Pardon? That's Fridays. I'm on the wrong day. All right, so last night, I asked you to take a look at the problem set here and to do in particular the last one number 10 do you guys remember the setup for this this was talking about straight hair versus curly hair we did the setup where I explained why we were going to take double of each one all right 
So let's. All right. So we're going to take our chi square. The important thing here is to rem remember that your chi square can extend for as many other possibilities that you have. So it may not be as simple as just one or two of these. This could theoretically go on for as many as there are. If there were a million different possibilities, it would be 999,999 of these lined up. We won't need to do that. But just keep in mind, it can keep extending. Now yesterday, after calculating out the uh, frequencies of our IC and our IS alleles, our values should have come out somewhere around these two. So, plugging those into the Hardy-Weinberg equation, it means that we can then calculate out exactly, let me see, there we go. We can now calculate out exactly the amount that we would expect to find, what their probability would be, right? Hopefully these numbers fairly well coincide with what you guys have got. Now, that means that we can now take these numbers, we can multiply them by the number of individuals, which they told us was 1,000, and get our expected values. And we know what our observed values are because they told us what our observed values are. 245 with straight hair, 362 with wavy hair, 393 with curly hair. So, we want to take these values that you see here and put them into this equation. So our observed value for straight hair was 245. So we do 245 minus our expected value, which would have been 180. Square that value, and then divide it by our expected again, which was 180. Do-do-do-do-do. All right, what did you guys get for your uh, first value? The observed versus the expected of straight hair. You should have set it up to look something like this. 245 minus 180, observed minus expected, squared, divided by 180. And then we can set up our next one for the wavy hair. 362 was our observed. We expected 490. Square that value, divide it by 490. And then finally for the curly hair, we observed 393. We expected uh, somewhere around 325, depending on how you rounded the values. 325 was what the answer page said. Do you guys have your totals? Okay, don't look at the screen yet then. Once you have your totals, see if you came out pretty close to what I've got here.
All right, and depending on how you rounded, that's totally within the acceptable uh, range. Yeah, 68.9 is fine. Once again, it does depend on exactly what values you took, where you rounded for how it would have come out at the end. Now, we can take that total value that you have. For me, it was 71.1. For Matt, it was 68.9. And now what we want to do, good, 71, perfect. Haha, -ha, my number, which makes it the best one. Why? Because I'm egotistical. Now we want to compare that. We had three different possibilities. One, two, three. That means we had two degrees of freedom. Three minus one is two. So now we look back over here to that chart. And you can see that our critical value that we're looking for is 5.99. Our total value is somewhere around 68 to 72. Do we accept or refuse? This is nowhere close. Absolutely. We reject the null hypothesis. We say there is something going on here. This is not the numbers that we should have if everything is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. How does that equation feel? All right, so remember, our degrees of freedom are going to be defined right up here in uh, this corner, I believe it is for you guys. It's the total number of possibilities. In this case, one, two, we had three different possibilities. We had our P squared, our 2PQ, and our Q squared minus one. It's always one less than the number of possibilities. Yeah, and that's one of the things, 99% of the time, I think it's safe to say that your critical value, or rather, sorry, your degree of freedom will be two or three. Very rarely, they've thrown a question at you that had five degrees of freedom because they did the same idea, but they did it with six-sided dice. And they said they rolled it a hundred times. You would expect an equal number of each one. And then they gave you what their actual observed values were. And your job was to determine, can we accept the null hypothesis? Or is this die weighted wrongly? All right, so let's, let's try one kind of as a group. So I'm going to use my disgusting piece of toilet paper because I'm a savage. Just in case anybody thought, no, all the marking on the toilet paper is because this is the same one I used to erase the whiteboard yesterday. If anybody thought that was poop, no. Just, no. Alright, so let me refocus this a little bit. Alright, so let's imagine... Come on, refocus on my hand. No? There we go. Alright, so let me give you guys an example. So let's imagine that we are out traveling the U.S. and we encounter a herd of bison. I don't know, out in, you know, Yosemite or something like that. Alright, there are 50,000 bison. And among that population, we find eight that are albino. Okay, well from that, I could first ask you guys, what are the frequencies of the normal colored allele compared to the albino allele? 
and you can probably figure out which one is dominant and which one is recessive. So we take our 8, divide it by our 50,000, and we'll end up with a value of point zero 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 one six. Now that's our Q squared because we are looking at the actual population. We're looking at numbers of individuals with this phenotype. So then take the square root of point zero 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 one six and we get a Q value of point zero one. Alright, well that means that our p-value is 0.99. So we figured out our frequencies. Now as Anderson says, from here you can go anywhere, you can do anything. Now we come back to this population five generations later. So it's been somewhere in the neighborhood of about 10 to 12 years. And we find out that it's not eight albinos in that population anymore. It's 14 albinos. Still the same total. The herd is still 50,000 strong. Now we want to know, is this population still at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? And this is how we have to figure it out. Now the nice thing is, our P and Q value, we really don't need at this point because we've already been given the actual number so when we were here last time we'll do our chi-square analysis we observed 14 this time we expected there to be eight just like last time because if it's in hardy weinberg equilibrium things really shouldn't change and then we put that over the expected value also of eight now this other side is going to get a little bit larger because if we're taking count of the albino population we also have to take count of the normal pigment so that means that for this one, we're going to be looking at 49,986 is our observed number of normals because 14 of them were albino, minus our expected value, 49,992, because we expected eight of them to be an albino. and then put it over the expected for this one again. Now you guys are going to see a trend happen a lot for the chi-square analysis and that is generally speaking especially if there's only two possibilities whatever the difference of one is should also be the difference of the other one. So this one is going to be six squared over eight and this one is going to be six squared over 49,992. So 36 divided by 8, 36 divided by 49,992. Take a moment, get your total. All right, what are we looking at? All right, so from our first one here, we're going to get 4.5. Is that still in view? Good. 
plus, and then over here, that number is going to be so unbelievably small that it's really not going to make much of a difference, is it? Did anybody get what 36 divided by 49,000 was? Because I got a value of basically 0 0.0007. Add those together, we're ending up at a value of 4.5. Now let's go and find our critical value. Let's see what we need. Well, how many possibilities did we have? Two. Two minus one is one. So we can go back to this chart and we can see the critical value for one degree of freedom is going to be 3.84. So how does 4.5 compare to 3.84? Ah, pretty close, but is it, is it above 3.84 or is it below 3.84? and it is above right therefore we must reject the null hypothesis we can claim now mathematically that the numbers that we got prove that the allele for that albinoism is spreading this is not in hardy weinberg equilibrium anymore one of those five rules got changed yes above gotta reject all right so, how does that feel for the math? Reasonably straightforward? All right. If you take a look, the homework that I lined up for you guys today is pretty straightforward. There's only, I believe, five questions. You can see them now right up there. Um, these are the homework problems for 3 slash 19. Question number one has three different parts. In the first part, they give you your total number of newts, 200 newts. They tell you that being poisonous is dominant over not being poisonous. And they tell you capital P for poisonous, little p for not poisonous. And they tell you there are eight that are not poisonous. Using our Hardy-Weinberg equations, you should be able to calculate out the P and the Q values. Then, question 1B will get, tell you that 50 newts get washed downstream after a big storm, and now they're in a new pond. They're setting up a new population. This is genetic drift. This is exactly what uh, we look at whenever we talk about something like gene flow. And now, in this new population... Um, we find 21 that are poisonous, 23 that are heterozygous, and 6 that are non-poisonous. You're going to be able to compare that back to the values that you would expect to have out of 50 individuals. That's awesome if you found a new, what kind, what color, red? Oh, green. Okay. That's that's kind of odd then. So the green newts that you see are generally either, as far as I understand it, are like a mature but not quite totally mature form. And what's going to happen is the green newts will swim around in the, in the pond for a little bit. Then they'll turn red, and then they go into a terrestrial phase of life, which lasts for a little while. And then eventually they'll turn green. And that's at full adulthood, and then they return back to the pond to be aquatic for the remainder of their life. The red ones are my favorite. They're red eft. They are red because they are insanely poisonous. All right. Now, that was question one about the newts. That's just seeing do the values match and possibly fig newtons. Um, and possibly, you know, do you have an explanation why? When you get into number two, 
Number two is actually going to give you now your Q value. And then it's going to say, in this grove of 500 peach trees, we found this many that are fuzzy, this many that are not. And it wants you to calculate whether or not there's a statistical difference. So that's actually using your chi-square analysis then. And as you uh, work your way through each of these questions, it's still going to be chi-square um, all the way down to the end. Question number five is... It's got a lot of text. It's not a hard question, but it has a lot of text. Take it one question mark at a time and just make sure that you answer each one of these. However you want to turn this stuff in, I do need something from you guys for this. If you can open it in Kami, put yours right on there, and then share it with me, that works. If you would prefer to get, for instance, a separate sheet of paper, like this and write everything down on it and then just snap a picture of that and email it to my Norwich uh, NCSD.org account that works fine too unfortunately we're missing the M&M lab this is where we would normally take a box of M&Ms take a look online to find out exactly what the Mars company says should be the percentage of the different colors per box and then we would do a chi-square analysis in order to find out are your values close enough to the ones that they say it should be or are they not telling the whole truth or did something go wrong with the machinery the good news is we'll still do the lab but we'll probably do it as a review lab right before the AP exam towards the end of April so as of right now do you guys have any questions about the chi-square analysis the slideshow is still there we go available up there for you to look through you can go through take any notes from it that you want to the question problems are still there tomorrow I want to meet up go over our answers to it try to make sure and see if everybody was on point and if not clear up any misconceptions um, and then we should be ready to move on just so you guys know we will be doing the evolution test coming up towards the end of next week it will be through the college board website on the AP classroom and I will have study guides and practice stuff for you as we get into the beginning of next week any questions before we call this one because wow these AP classes take so much longer than like the normal bio ones do right now Um, I don't need the answer to yesterday's. Yesterday was just going to be practice. We've already worked on Hardy Weinberg. Just kind of a refresher. All right. Well, in which case, if anybody does have any questions, please feel free to contact me through Schoology, through email, whichever way you want. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye.